Lecture 2, The City as a Machine. Looking back at uh, where we've been already so far, uh, we looked at the city as a cosmos as the first of three paradigms. This is the second one, the city as a machine. The third one is the city as an organism. The interesting thing about uh, the larger issues of this topic if you look at the total span of time, uh, the first human settlements that we looked at uh, or we talked about at the point of the agricultural revolution, when people first started to settle together in large numbers, the, uh, the differentiation of different activities and the variety of engagements that suddenly became possible uh, created a village as if it were the whole world. And uh, it, the diversity of engagements and activities made it like an entire world unto itself. As the world becomes more and more interconnected, what we are finding is the world is more acting like a village. We have access in many ways to people on the other side of the planet uh, in ways that have never been possible before such that engagements with other people uh, that otherwise would have been limited to a very small circle of people uh, in close physical proximity is now more or less unlimited uh, to the entire surface of the planet. Uh, and so the, uh, the great architectural and urban historian Lewis Mumford uh, is the one who uh, started and finished his book uh, the city in history, uh, thinking about the village as a world and the world as a village. Uh, these three topics of the city as a cosmos, the city as a machine, and the city as an organism are useful in that they have uh, been observable throughout history and continue to be observable today. It resonates with what we see in architecture as well, even if we have emphasized the processes of form making most characteristic of the city as a cosmos, the dominance of the form of buildings and cities, uh, the architecture has recently shifted out of necessity uh, in the 20th century to consider the issues of the city and architecture as a machine uh, that operates in a systematic way. And so the city as a machine is associated with the idea of systems and how they are designed and how they operate. The third topic of the city as a machine uh, is, I mean, the city as an organism is interesting in that it deals with emergent complex phenomena that are beyond the grasp of any single designer, any single system. Uh, but it deals more with the complex interaction of phenomena that emerge uh, in or more or less organic ways, unpredictable, uh, and that we have to understand. This is more reminiscent of the uh, newer uh, obligation for purely pragmatic purposes of dealing with the planet as an ecosystem in order to try to strike things, uh, a better balance between different forces around the world. And so uh, every city that we look at, uh, there are bound to be uh, aspects of all three of these characteristics, cosmos, machine, organism, or if you're looking at the categories of phenomena, form, system, and emergence. Uh, but today's, uh, we're looking at uh, the two cities, uh, primarily of Rome, uh, back in the day, uh, and Chicago uh, during uh, the 19th century and 20th century uh, during the great expansion of across North America. Uh, and so we start here with uh, this embodiment of what it means to create a city. Uh, the original city form, uh, the symbol of the city, is this cross uh, in a circle bounded by a square. And uh, the idea here is that the cross is the striking of order in a world of disorder. Uh, 
And so here you see the city as a machine trying to strike order on a landscape that is anything but machine-like. And this is the town of Miletus in present-day Turkey. It was one of the first designed grids uh, that we have discovered. Uh, it is uh, a peninsula that sticks out into the sea and is characterized by a highly irregular topography and form, yet tamed by the operation of the grid uh, to create something that is more systematically uh, manageable, an imprint on the, on the land uh, of these different grids that were established at different times. And it's uh, emblematic of an overarching strategy, like the symbol was in the last slide, of uh, creating a man-made order, imposing an order upon a disordered world. Uh, we see this strategy at work even in conditions of extreme disorder, as we see in the city of San Francisco. Why would it's sensible to put a grid on a flat landscape, but why on earth would anyone put a grid on a hilly landscape? In Boston, we knock down the hills uh, in order to make a more flat landscape. In San Francisco, the capacity for doing that was very limited, and uh, the grid is imposed except for Lombard Street uh, across uh, the topography. Switching to Rome, Rome itself was uh, a place that uh, grew from a collection of villages into an agglomeration of villages. It was one of the first cities in the Western world to have a high concentration of people um, depicted here in a model. Uh, here the primary uh, features of uh, the river, uh, uh, Tiberius River, the seven hills, and the walls, the succession of walls, and the famous architectural features. It's a quite um, uh, messy business uh, looked at from this view. And the diagrammatic view is only slightly better. Uh, to make sense of all of this, uh, Pope Sixtus V uh, in the first millennium uh, you know, the Common Era, uh, used this type of idea of landmarks, referring back to Lynch's, one of Lynch's uh, five elements in uh, the cognitive mapping of cities, to impose uh, an order onto this disordered landscape where the sight lines between the great uh, monuments and landmarks of Christianity uh, became available through the cutting of new roads uh, and streets through the fabric of the city such that you could see one monument from the other and it became the basis of and was also a reflection of both operations happening. Um, it was based on the requirement that uh, Christians uh, engage in a pilgrimage uh, from one monument to the next and so the event, the historical enactment of humans in time uh, through this ritual, not so different from the Kraton uh, in Java, uh, the city as cosmos force resulted in the uh, imprint of straight line geometries across the urban landscape connecting one grand monument to the other in a strategy that has been repeated throughout history to the present moment because it is an experiential phenomenon of architecture and urbanism uh, based on the geometry of light and vision uh, which happens to uh, operate according to straight lines. And so we see the ordering systems of the Roman Forum uh, in London, I mean in Rome, that uh, they're all based on these straight line geometries of vision. And the origin of that is the human organism itself and the way vision works. Uh, we actually leave Rome and see the logic of the Roman operating system, as it has been called, um, uh, in its colonized uh, world. Uh, the spread of Roman influence across the Mediterranean in the early centuries of the Common Era. Uh, it was a remarkable uh, achievement and it 
was largely achieved through military means, but also uh, one of the chief instruments of achieving this colonial expansion of Roman power was architecture and the form of its settlements. And here's uh, a typical Roman settlement, one of the better preserved uh, examples in Timgad in northern Africa in the present uh, nation of Algeria. Uh, you can see the uh, the square blocks, the organized grid system within a square wall, which was not always the case, but in this case it was, uh, and the large chunks of architecture that uh, populate this landscape and uh, characterize the big collective functions uh, through which the the city uh, of the town of Timgad operated. Uh, and it is uh, an example, a clear example that was followed in towns and cities throughout the Mediterranean world as influenced uh, by the Romans. Uh, Vitruvius uh, did not just write about architecture, but he also, primarily at the beginning, uh, started with settlement patterns. And here you see the basic strategy of uh, establishing a grid, uh, an ordered system, even when the outline of the city is not ordered and responds to the topography of a place. Uh, the Cardo and Decumanus, the north, south, and east, west central axes, cross uh, at the center of the settlement and marks the most important location around which the Roman Forum, the temples, uh, the other elements, uh, the building types that are characteristic of the Roman town. And so David Macaulay, the architecture graduate from RISD, who became uh, what we think of as a children's book illustrator, but of course it's not just for kids. Uh, he did a brilliant job illustrating the way the Roman military camp, uh, with the logic of it, the system, systematic establishment of settlements on the landscape, and the geometries that flow from that logic. And so in his uh, fictitious uh, town of Verbonia, uh, he shows the different elements, architectural elements of the classic Roman settlement uh, distributed on this grid with the uh, Cardo and Decumanus crossing at the center. Uh, we also see uh, the, the instrument uh, by which uh, this grid system was laid out. Uh, it was quite clever. Uh, the, the monument was embedded in the earth to uh, an immovable marker to uh, maintain a stable point of reference off of which uh, this instrument can be used to sight uh, across long distances as far as one can see. Uh, the geometry of the Cardo and Decumanus uh, uh, crossing uh, the landscape. And it was quite a sophisticated achievement, unprecedented. Uh, here you see uh, it being used in Macaulay's illustration. And it was one of the chief instruments for establishing Roman influence across, uh, at its peak at this point, shown in this map, uh, what we now think of as Europe uh, and much of the Mediterranean world. Uh, this was quite a remarkable achievement. One of the things that made it possible, and here you see it actually in time-lapse, uh, the different tribes um, of Europe, uh, the Muslims, uh, uh, the Moors, uh, and then the influence of Rome um, spreading out across, out from Rome, and in an unprecedented spread of influence uh, right across the continents. Um, and you get a sense, uh, this is, illustrates one of the limitations of mapping that uh, we see these stationary maps and it doesn't really give you a sense of the powerful forces that operate uh, across landscapes. Uh, the road system uh, was chief among these. It demonstrated to many local people uh, this tremendous capacity for the Romans, the Roman armies to establish order on uh, a hostile landscape and to tame the world. 
uh, in effect. And it was very convincing, and it was a very important part of the expansion of Roman power uh, was to demonstrate, was the capacity to demonstrate to the local uh, tribes and chiefs and uh, others that uh, this power wasn't just a military force, but it was also quite a clear demonstration. Uh, and uh, Rome became very wealthy because of this uh, influence. Uh, the tributes, the road system was a basis of collecting wealth uh, and resources from a vast empire um, that waxed and waned uh, over the several centuries, uh, as you have studied uh, in your other history courses, I hope. And here we see uh, Tim God in northern Africa, uh, in aerial view, uh, it was abandoned and thus its, uh, its imprint on the landscape uh, remains very clear. Uh, there it is mapped. Uh, you see the elements as we looked at. Uh, we see a few examples um, in the upper left, the, the generic diagram of the camp, the military camp that then grows into the towns. Uh, we see here example from North Africa uh, and then from Rome um, and then Vienna. And so every city uh, that the Romans um, settled, established, uh, every place it went, it established this pattern that you can still see in many of the, the places, uh, the cities uh, throughout Europe, despite the fact that not a single building may exist from that time. Uh, the grids of cities are extremely durable and persistent, and they have a way of self-replicating uh, themselves over centuries. And so here we say we see the uh, the city of Como, Italy, that uh, very clearly demonstrates uh, the longevity of the Roman grid. You still see it here, even as it expanded. Here's uh, a representation of an earlier uh, situation where you see very clearly the Roman uh, elements in a, in a figure ground drawing of that. You, here's a section of Germany, modern day Germany, um, where you see the influence of uh, the R Roman system spreading. And here's the road system. Uh, you've heard the, the phrase, all roads lead to Rome. Uh, this is where that comes from uh, and became a big part of the commerce and pilgrimage routes uh, that were obligated obligations of religion and later uh, became uh, what we now think of as tourism. But towns rose and fall, fell depending on their position on this network, um, especially uh, later in later times and actually through to today. And so if you look at a place like Florence, Italy, which I believe you have, you can see the Duomo. I'm sorry, I don't have a pointer. Uh, but you see the Duomo there uh, near the center of this image. And uh, do you see the pattern of the Roman uh, settlement um, there? It's, uh, I don't have a pointer, but let me highlight it in this way. Uh, and so there you can still see legible in the uh, contemporary grid uh, today, the uh, etching, etched in the fabric of Florence, uh, the imprint of its, of its original Roman settlement. And one of the telltale indicators is where the streets take a bend. Uh, it's an indicator that that is where uh, a Roman gate once was. You can even make out the Cardo and Decumanus uh, of this plan. Uh, this way of uh, settlement were, was dominated by the walls and with a, only a limited number of gates in and out of the city is something that continued to characterize cities moving forward in time. And so you see a second wall uh, several centuries later, a third wall, uh, and then the walls uh, that went up uh, in the period when the Ottoman Empire was a threat to much of Europe. Um, and it's only after the fall of the uh, hostilities uh, that the walls were removed and a dramatic expansion of the urban fabric was possible. 
In some cities like Vienna, it became the basis of, uh, of what we now think of as one of the grand uh, elements of cities anywhere, which is the Ringstrasse in Vienna. Uh, here we see Cologne, Germany. Uh, you may be able to, uh, I'm sorry, I don't have a pointer available, but um, perhaps uh, you can pause here and uh, try to trace the different series of walls uh, based on the, uh, the form of the Grand Boulevards and the places where you can see the pattern uh, characteristic of gates. Towns tended to form at river crossings uh, because it was an important defensive uh, location, but the entire landscape uh, would have been etched with these grids. Even in uh, modern Italy and across Europe, you can see the Roman grid pattern. Uh, once established, it doesn't go away easily, and you can see it in the agricultural landscape uh, as well. The Romans also uh, were brilliant engineers uh, operating uh, within these settlements to manage the drainage system. Here you see the early stormwater sewers that were also used for um, human waste. Uh, you see the origins of the pedestrian crosswalk uh, stripe. Uh, they were stepping stones because the streets were the places uh, that flooded when in times of heavy rainfall. The other big issue uh, that the Romans proved their mastery was the uh, distribution of uh, fresh water. And they mastered the science of engineering aqueducts. Uh, one of the difficult aspects of the aqueduct was you needed to maintain a certain flow of water. So you had to understand uh, the pitch and the hydrodynamics of and the, the friction of water flow. Uh, because you had to keep it flowing sufficiently uh, to supply the city to prevent stagnation. But you also could not allow it to flow too quickly because that would uh, prematurely erode the mortar of the masonry uh, and the other uh, aspects of the construction and lead to a premature failure of the structure of the aqueduct uh, or whatever the channel was if it wasn't elevated. And so this was quite a sophisticated uh, undertaking for all the structural reasons as well. Uh, hopefully you've studied uh, vaulting. Um, let's go to the United States. Uh, these, this issue of the grid was not just uh, a, a very convincing element uh, for the management of the landscape. It also served uh, commercial purposes, uh, which steps uh, forward in time uh, with greater clarity when it comes to the gridded system uh, that Thomas Jefferson established in 1796 uh, for the United States. Uh, and the idea of the grid system was to manage this vast landscape of North America in a system that would allow uh, a uniform and logical, systematic uh, there's that word again, uh, development of the landscape. And so the township method um, was used. It was a six by six mile square divided into uh, 36 squares, uh, each uh, square one mile by one mile, and then subdivided further in a system that created uh, uh, uniform uh, areas of uh, multiples of uh, 5, 20, uh, t uh, 40 acres and 80 acres uh, to make a very rational system of land subdivision. Uh, the system uh, had its logic uh, replicated across the landscape and it was the subject of a monumental land survey in which the uh, markers of this grid were laid down in the ground by an army of surveyors dispatched across the landscape. And like the Roman grid, um, this grid of the Jeffersonian grid is likely to remain uh, forever long after uh, we're all gone. Uh, and 
the interest one of the interesting things is that this grid is laid across such a vast area of the planet that uh, it has to do something to account for the curvature of the earth and so you see the use on the upper left of correction lines uh, to uh, reconcile the flat logic of a grid with the curved reality of the planet. And uh, the other aspect was the surveyors needed guidelines uh, by which to lay all these, um, these markers out. So a system of baselines were established similar to the logic used by Pope Sixtus V in Rome, which were sight lines. Uh, they were armed with telescopes. They would sight on the peaks of mountains or other uh, landmarks that were visible from long distances uh, so that they could be verified across large uh, areas. Here is one of the correction lines. And this is emblematic of an interesting uh, situation. The uh, the commonplace understanding of what maps do is that we look at the world and we figure out what is going on and we draw a map of it. And so the map is a passive reflection of the reality of the world. Uh, this is very similar to uh, the conversation, the ongoing conversation about cities between passive reflections and active instruments. Uh, but here we have uh, a landscape that uh, is anything but, um, a, it's the opposite. We see here that the abstract logic of the Jeffersonian grid is, uh, is the first thing. It is mapped first and then laid out on this curved planet second. And so the abstract map is actually uh, an, an active instrument for creating form on the planet. So it is uh, something that is man-made and imposed on the world um, uh, after the fact. Um, not so unlike the city as cosmos, but for different purposes. And despite the fact that hundreds of people die each year, surprised by these sharp bends, uh, uh, this is just um, the cost of doing business. Uh, here you see an interesting uh, condition where the early uh, settlement of the city of Los Angeles occurred reasonably enough according to the form of the landscape, the rivers, uh, uh, and the grid was imposed in an ordered way according to those alignments uh, and local logic of responding to the, the form of the topography. And only after the fact, the larger system of uh, the grid, according to some other mapping logic, uh, was imposed on top of that. And so you get uh, this. Uh, this is how uh, dis, uh, dislocations, um, impurities of the grid form. And so where, whenever you look at a city, you will be able to see several grids and you should be able to uh, puzzle out the logics uh, according to these types of, of uh, operations to reconcile two different systems and post at two different times according to two different logics. Here we see one of the markers uh, like the markers uh, that are all over our, our continent. Uh, this one is in Yosemite. Uh, but this is the way the world uh, works. This is how we keep track of everything. Um, now, this we switch now from North America to look uh, specifically at the city of Chicago. As uh, the reading uh, points out at great length, uh, at one time the American landscape uh, was populated by um, hundreds uh, of different distinct nations of uh, native peoples, the first nations of North America, who lived uh, off the landscape in ways that um, uh, were in conflict with the European settlers. There were no land boundaries. Uh, these, this grid imposed on the landscape uh, was in sharp uh, contradiction to 
the tradition and custom of not owning land. Land is not something that can possibly be owned. It was a ludicrous idea to the First Nations. Uh, it was the giver of life. It was the source of all sustenance and uh, the concept that, it, that something uh, on the ground, uh, immovable, something permanently affixed in place could be owned was a crazy idea. And uh, this is not just an archaic uh, a notion uh, doomed to disappearance. Actually, the conflict between these two worldviews continues to today. Um, and many of the conflicts and issues that arise throughout the Global South have to do with um, attempts to reconcile uh, the two very distinct sets of needs. Um, here we see uh, the landscape uh, depicted in painting, uh, this noble savage uh, celebrated by Rousseau, uh, one of the fathers of uh, the culture of enlightenment, uh, living uh, in this uh, harmony with the landscape uh, in all its brutal uh, beauty uh, of uh, including the savage uh, forces of nature uh, the, just the sublime, the celebration of the sublime, sublime forces of nature that are bigger than us all. Then arrives the, um, moving quickly through this history, uh, the European settlers uh, set up the grid and the instrument of establishing that grid and ownership, of course, were these architectural impositions of boundaries, hardened, hardened boundaries. Uh, and fencing was the key technology. Uh, the split rail fence used a lot of wood that was not available and so it actually uh, was a dramatic uh, shift when the technology became available suddenly of extruded uh, iron uh, rods to actually create wire barbed wire was a crucial technological uh, innovation that allowed uh, this fencing to occur and so the Industrial Revolution uh, is very much connected to the conquest of uh, the landscape, uh, first uh, for ranching and then for agriculture. Uh, people came uh, in order to become landowners. They swarmed from Europe, uh, the, the poor uh, areas of European cities. Uh, people looking for opportunity came to the New World uh, and where the promise of free land became uh, a great driver of a population shift. And here we see, again, celebrated in painting, the great goddess Athena and the march of progress from east, from you see in the background, uh, the city of Manhattan, um, people arriving from Europe and crossing the continent, uh, pushing back the, the savages, conquering the wilderness, um, first by horse-drawn wagons, uh, carriages, uh, the agriculture, you know, pulling um, agricultural capacity out of this brutal landscape, uh, chopping down the trees, uh, stretching the telegraph cable is Athena herself leading the way for the railways, uh, branching out from uh, across the landscape. Uh, and so here we see a tale of progress from sea to shining sea. Um, you will hear mention, if you haven't studied this already, the Turner thesis of the uh, manifest destiny of uh, the Europeans to conquer North America. It's all connected. Um, here we see the land demarcation system imposed on Oklahoma. Oklahoma was to have been the last final resting place, the homeland of these First Nations that were driven off the rest of the continent. But um, surprise, surprise, uh, we wanted that too. So uh, it happened all at once in the great land rush. Uh, the guns went off and people uh, stormed across uh, the grasslands to stake their claims. Uh, the land offices were uh, swarmed with settlers staking their claims. Um, this is the Wild West. Uh, the uh, Europeans brought with them uh, the, the symbols of high culture and that became uh, 
a constant theme uh, of the development of the Wild West was how do you bring a more sophisticated sense. And Chicago is uh, a very clear tale of that. Um, it started out as uh, a fishing uh, uh, settlement, a hunting uh, settlement, and Fort Dearborn uh, was established there based on uh, this stagnant little creek uh, that just by fluke of nature turned out to be one of the better spots to shelter from a storm on Lake Michigan. Um, the reading goes into this at some depth, so uh, we'll quickly jump ahead to uh, beyond where the reading uh, focuses to the canals uh, that became the basis for uh, Chicago. Um, uh, Conan actually does a great job of uh, demonstrating the illusion that it was inevitable for Chicago to become a great city. Uh, it wasn't inevitable. Uh, it was one of many places that could have flourished. Uh, but the story that, that was very convincing, and this is one of the themes of the course, is how powerful stories play a role in uh, the development of cities. Uh, the city of Dubai is based on a grand tale of uh, future value for investment, and thus um, we have the tallest building in the world in a place that really has no natural advantage at all. It's just a story. Uh, Chicago uh, in the 1930s, uh, the land rush, the speculative bubble, the skyrocketing of land values uh, is similar to what we see in Dubai. And uh, we saw it in Detroit, uh, Buffalo, uh, cities across uh, North America that at one time boomed. Buffalo, uh, for example, was one of the largest cities in North America uh, and looked like it was, uh, was destined to, for greatness, but now it has collapsed. The reason Buffalo was a big deal is the Erie Canal. The Erie Canal is what uh, connected um, the Midwest to uh, the East Coast um, for a short period of a uh, few decades. Uh, and the promise, uh, the prospect of a connection between the Great Lakes uh, that were connected to the East Coast uh, by the Erie Canal, uh, shortening the route so you didn't have to go down the St. Lawrence Seaway, um, that uh, the prospect of that 15-foot rise uh, in the Chicago River that would allow uh, eventually someone to cut a canal from Chicago to the Mississippi and connect New York to New Orleans uh, in a much more direct route. Uh, that was that story of the prospect of that connection on the Chicago River was the basis of a huge land uh, uh, boom in Chicago. When the canal was actually finally cut uh, and making this empire, which is the basis of the empire state uh, label for New York, uh, it was already uh, about to be displaced by the next great technological innovation, which was the railroad. Canals were uh, a great thing to build because uh, the physics of water transportation mean that uh, a single mule or a couple of mules can pull uh, uh, huge uh, volumes and weights of goods uh, effortlessly, practically, along a towpath. Uh, it's a very low energy input. Water remains one of the miracles of transportation. That's why we get bottled water from Fiji. Uh, and because water transportation is so cheap and efficient. Coal that fired the, uh, the locomotives was plentiful, and so the railroad started to compete with the canals. And so here we see the, the grid uh, division of Chicago that allowed people to buy and sell land in Chicago, uh, in New York City, after the Commission um, of 1812 um, set up the grid of Manhattan, and across the continent um, around the same time, land was bought and sold uh, without ever being seen because it became a standardized commodity. Uh, the 
a 40-acre plot of land in uh, one part of the grid across North America was deemed, for the purposes of uh, buying and selling land, more or less equivalent to any other 40-acre plot uh, across the continent. It was assumed to be somewhat fertile, uh, and the same thing was true of the 25 by 100 foot lots in New York or Chicago. Uh, they were all the same, and so they could be bought and sold. It was, from an architectural point of view, it also meant that you could design a building and put it anywhere. And so you only needed uh, one design and uh, one size does fit all because they're all the same size. Um, the reading mentions von Thunen's model of land value, uh, which was a concentric model, uh, all else being equal, uh, the land at the center uh, is worth more and it's ever decreasing. Um, this is uh, something that became very uh, commonly taught and understood in the 20th century, especially in North America because it happened to match uh, some of our, the stories we were telling about um, central city, central business districts being of the highest value. Uh, the zone of transition in Chicago, uh, the concentric zone model is also referred to as Chicago school um, for various reasons. The urbanists uh, who proliferated this model, economists who proliferated this model uh, were from Chicago uh, and they looked at Chicago and they said uh, all you have to do is um, take out the, the right hand chunk to account for Lake Michigan and you basically have a concentric zone model it operates just like this. Uh, other models are also uh, theorized and visible in the landscape. The sector model is something where uh, you'll notice that Brookline is uh, wealthier than um, Dorchester. Uh, and so you, if that's what you're looking at, you might prefer to believe in the sector model uh, that would account for certain pie-shaped wedges uh, growing out of the city. Some would say the streetcar lines or the road system. Um, where the better streetcar lines are, you have wealthier wedges. Um, and where they are worse, you have less wealthy wedges. Um, sure, that there is an impact there, uh, but when you look at the, the larger system, and the next one is the multiple nuclei model or the polynucleic model, some would say that's uh, Los Angeles is the clearest example of that. Uh, it starts to uh, fall apart a bit, and uh, you start to doubt whether there is any single model that accounts for urban formation, especially if you look at European cities where the concentric zone model is flipped on its head. The commuter zone, um, that's where the poor people live in Europe. Wealthy people live in the city, poor people live on the periphery. And in the United States, for very specific reasons, that hierarchy is flipped on its head. Although uh, there are signs that we are emptying out our suburbs and the wealthy are returning to cities, but that's another story. Um, the, and the, but the, the punchline of this uh, is that uh, it depends on the story that is being told. Uh, and this is one of the uh, things that becomes uh, increasingly important as we look at different things. Uh, the story you tell will have a significant impact on uh, which uh, model is followed. Uh, these models are not just passive uh, observations. They also have an impact on how cities develop. Uh, and that's almost a Heisenberg uncertainty principle if you're into physics of real estate development. So Chicago becomes, uh, the Chicago River uh, becomes the location of um, vast uh, industry, uh, industrial production. Uh, uh, the Chicago River and the rail lines, here we see the Erie Canal. Um, uh, the big theme here is city as machine. And Chicago offers an example, uh, a vivid example, of how uh, it's not just, uh, we can see buildings that work as machines. We can see urban form that works as machines. We can see 
urban infrastructures, transportation infrastructures, including the Chicago River, the Erie Canal. It is a giant machine. Uh, and the railways, again, and then the roadways are also parts of one giant machine. Uh, and so here we see Rochester, New York, that are uh, becomes a node on this giant machine. And cities uh, across upstate New York uh, grow and boom because they are nodes along uh, this piece of infrastructure. Um, and uh, the architectural scale uh, becomes a place of dramatic innovation where the grain elevator uh, is a remarkable invention that increases the efficiency uh, and makes uh, the transfer of huge volumes of grain very efficient uh, and productive. Uh, we won't go into that. But as the railways grow and uh, uh, displace the activity of the canals, there is a very sharp competition between cities across the Midwest to become the logical location of uh, the dominant railroad hubs. And St. Louis, uh, as Cronin um, points out, has a huge advantage uh, because of its location at the intersection of the uh, major rivers uh, feeding into the Mississippi. But the boosterism of Chicago prevails, uh, and Chicago expands dramatically uh, from with the dawn of the rail empires uh, around the 1850s. Uh, the uh, railways are being built, the, the great um, uh, production of rail ties uh, are in part, the great forests are cut down uh, to supply the railroad ties for this very rapid uh, expansion of rail infrastructure across the continent. Also, the, uh, the wood frame structures, uh, balloon framing uh, is invented in order to create an extremely uh, rapid deployment of housing production. Uh, you'll notice the uh, double height uh, studs that create air channels between the first floor and the second floor, which uh, will play a role in a future episode of this lecture. Chicago becomes, um, builds up very quickly, uh, industry locating along uh, the Chicago River. As the railways come into play, there is a conjunction between the water infrastructure and the rail infrastructure with the architectural elements operating as the key nodes of uh, transfer between these vast um, infrastructures that cover so much of the planet. And so you see the expansion of the rail and waterways, uh, the infrastructure converging on Chicago at a certain point uh, one quarter of the world's railways all uh, passed through Chicago. Uh, and so this is a depiction that, sh that starts to give you a sense of the form of the larger machine uh, of which Chicago was a part. Uh, this is a, a more recent uh, uh, depiction of what was already going on, uh, starting to form back uh, at that moment where the, the remarkably productive, fertile agricultural lands of the middle uh, area of America uh, became the breadbasket of the world, not just because it was productive, but also because it was attached to these infrastructures of water and rail, all converging on Chicago. Uh, and so the, the rapid deployment of uh, these work teams to lay out the rails it was financed by land speculation uh, along the rail lines. Uh, the railway companies financed their activities by uh, speculating on land values along their right-of-way. Uh, a piece of the prairie uh, distant from any infrastructure is worth next to nothing. But a piece of the prairie, that same piece of prairie, next to a town with a rail terminal or a water terminal uh, is suddenly worth a great deal more. And this is um, uh, where the sectors come into play and complicate Von Tunen's uh, or uh, Christoller's 
central place theory model of concentric circles. Uh, transportation infrastructure disrupts the purity of the concentric circles. And all of a sudden, something that is 100 miles away turns out to be closer to uh, the marketplace and thus higher in value than a parcel that might only be uh, 15 miles away. Um, and so infrastructure distorts everything, including land values. Uh, the increase in land value uh, is what finance the rail infrastructure. And this is a brilliant uh, financial strategy that we have uh, made illegal in the city of Boston and everywhere else in North America. So that's why um, the mass transit system is simultaneously one of the greatest machines of adding value, financial value to the city. And at the same time, it's bankrupt uh, because it's illegal for it to take advantage of any of the value it creates. Um, here we see the, uh, the mobilization of forests, uh, very rapid deforestation uh, for the construction of the railways uh, and of the housing of the great cities. Here again, the balloon frame construction uh, and uh, it's um, devastating, uh, setting the stage for the devastating fire of Chicago in 1871, um, knocking out um, the core of the city, uh, throwing the city into crisis um, at a moment when uh, it was, uh, the wave was cresting. But there was barely a pause in its development. Uh, the architects of the East, Henry Hobson Richardson, Lewis Sullivan, uh, and an army of other architects and builders flooded to Chicago to rebuild it, uh, and thus sparking one of the greatest outpourings of architectural production in uh, American history. Um, uh, the stockyards, uh, continuing with the theme of the city as a node in a landscape that together with the architecture of the city and the landscape is a single uh, machine for production. Uh, the agricultural production was gathered uh, by boat, by rail, and uh, siphoned into Chicago where it then went out by boat uh, to the rest of the world. And uh, the one thing that was better, more profitable than agricultural production was cattle. Um, the tough thing with cattle is how do you keep uh, the meat fresh? Well, rule number one, keep it alive. March your cattle, uh, let your cattle move under its own steam to the slaughterhouse in Chicago. Um, and then uh, at first you move them out by cattle car, still alive to the cities of the east, but then you um, develop uh, systems of refrigerated rail cars uh, so that you can slaughter them uh, right there on site. And this are the Union Stockyards uh, uh, that was one of the great tourist attractions of Chicago. It was so huge and smelled so bad uh, that people had to come see it. And so it's the at the uh, juncture, the intersection of the rail machinery, uh, the, the stockyards, the factories in which they were processed, uh, and then the infrastructure for distributing the meat in refrigerated cars. Uh, the architecture of uh, death uh, that was remarkably effective at uh, using gravity to uh, help uh, increase the efficiency of processing uh, animals into food. Um, starting at the top of the building, uh, the animals would be killed and the weight of uh, the carcass itself would be uh, what drove the machinery um, through the system of processing down to the lower floors um, where they were packaged and went out in refrigerated uh, rail cars to the cities of the east. Um, the architectural structural innovations, the invention of steel uh, that had to be protected from fire um, in this great innovation of fireproof construction led to a huge building boom um, uh, and the innovations hopefully that you've seen in history of architecture courses uh, with the steel frame structures uh, clad by thin uh, thin uh, 
envelopes of terracotta, steel, glass, uh, the new construction innovations, um, and moving very quickly through the 20th century, uh, we see the shift from uh, the railways as an infrastructure of industrial production quickly to become uh, a, an instrument of moving people, bodies throughout the city uh, as part of the um, lubricating of the system of moving people uh, from the residential districts into town. Uh, here you see the Chicago Loop. The emphasis here is less on the stockyards have moved out um, or are about to move out. They're still here on the, on the left. Uh, and, but we see the transition from industrial production to uh, higher uh, levels of uh, business um, and the rise of uh, the tall buildings. Uh, here, Lewis Sullivan's famous depiction of uh, how do you deal with the problem of tall buildings, which still is an issue uh, that, that architects are struggling with. Um, and finally, to uh, the World Columbian Exposition of uh, 1893, um, Burnham, uh, famously make no little plans, uh, the elevation of classical uh, architectural styles uh, to uh, new heights of expressions of culture, just like the organ in the prairie. Uh, Chicago had to uh, strive to uh, class up their act. Uh, the stinking stockyards uh, were, were a great tourist attraction but it was a little humiliating. So uh, the, now the new focus was on the civic pride of its uh, claims, uh, not just to great wealth, but to great cultural achievements. And there is no city uh, in North America that does not have some sign of this uh, move uh, in it, embedded in its landscape. Uh, Boston, we have the Museum of Fine Arts we have uh, the Boston Public Library, uh, the axial formation of roads. Uh, within these halls, we, we tamed and uh, celebrated the triumphs of industrial production, but outside we expressed the forms of high cultural achievement. Uh, and uh, Chicago, um, Cleveland is one of the most tremendous expressions of uh, this white city phenomena. Uh, colonial cities around the world, uh, including uh, Manila, the Philippines, uh, Burnham uh, went all over the world uh, peddling these design strategies uh, to dignify cities everywhere. Um, and uh, eventually leading under the influence of uh, the upgrading of the plan for Washington, D.C., uh, Chicago uh, the famous uh, plan of Chicago of 1909 uh, was uh, uh, takes us back to where we started. Uh, employing strategy of the city beautiful uh, axial boulevards, uh, just like Hausman's Paris, uh, these grand views, long views, uh, ending on architectural monuments. Uh, Pope Sixtus V did it in Rome. Hausman did it in Paris. And the City Beautiful movement uh, spread that strategy to cities throughout the world, even to the day.